Hello, everybody. Chris Gethin here, and welcome to another episode of the Knowledge and Mileage podcast. This one is actually being recorded in Boise, Idaho, in person with my good buddy, old buddy, oh, Mets dear. and Alan. Welcome to the country and welcome to the podcast, buddy. Thanks, bro. It's uh, great to be here. Um, obviously, it's been over 10 years since I've been to Boise, and um, I can't remember what it looked like back then. But I actually love the, uh, where you live, the views, um, the hospitality. Hospitality is probably the best. The best part, part about it, and um, obviously, you know, coming down and, and being able to do this podcast with you is, a, you know, is an honour. I'm looking forward to it. Should be honoured to actually be in my presence. Well, yeah. you know, sometimes I uh, pinch myself that. You know, you can get so many things wrong and I still like you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I screw it up all the time and you still keep coming back. That's right. Uh, but anyway, yeah, like the last time you were here was like 2008 maybe, I think it was, 2008. But obviously we've seen each other a lot since then. We see each other at the Arnold Classic, the Olympia. I've come to uh, Australia. That's where his weird accent is coming from. We, uh, you know, done some seminars mm. for you over, over in uh, Titan Fitness there. And we've gone down to Melbourne to meet up with guys and whatever. Yeah. So we've always been in touch, yeah. just never had you back out here, which is uh, about bloody time, actually. Yeah. Next time you've got to get out here in the winter, bring the family as well, go skiing. Because they haven't experienced snow, have they? No, no, they haven't. And uh, definitely it's on uh, my bucket list. And uh, well, after I showed them the video of your place, um, I think they're starting to feel it and get excited about coming back. Yeah, be some, rude not for them to come. Oh, I've got to, got to come back. I've got to show you some of my, my skills down the slopes. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. On your face. On my face, yeah. that's right. <laughs> anyway, so um, so let's let's go into a little bit about your background. So I met you back, God, it must have been like 2002, 2003 or something like yeah. that, when I was living in Sydney, mm. and I would come and train at your gym. Mm. We got introduced uh, by a mutual friend. Yeah. And uh, started training there specifically, more so on weekends when I could get away from my own gym. Yeah. I wanted to go train somewhere else, and you had a great facility out there, like in Rockdale. You had another, uh, you had two gyms. You yeah. had two gyms there. Kensington. Yeah, in Kensington. And now you've got this freaking awesome facility uh, in Coogee, mm. of all places, right on the beach there. And I actually did a documentary interview with Alex Ardenti the other day for his new series that's going to be on Netflix called Access Muscle. And they said, what is the largest and most impressive gym that you've uh, in attended uh, in the world? And I said it was Titan Fitness, mm. you know. Yeah. And one of the things that I absolutely love about that place is the camaraderie, the, the, so the social platform that you've created within that place. And the leadership that you have within the team, you know, it's like everyone owns their position. Everyone helps each other out. There's a real good positive atmosphere there. It's held over several floors. The place is spotless. I think you've got a bit of, um, that's probably down to you and Susie mm -hmm. as well. And you've got the great gym equipment and you've got just a phenomenal view there. It, 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 it's spot on. And one of the things that, there's a few things that I want to talk about here today. But, uh, you know, t tell us a little bit about your background to begin with. And then what got you into the gym industry? And what was that struggle? Because I know there was a struggle there for a while. Yeah. Talking to, because there's going to be a lot of people here listening who want to make a career out of fitness mm. or want to have something similar, but they could relate to the path that you had to go through yeah. to struggle and make a lot of sacrifices mm. in order to realize the amazing success that you're living today. Well, we started back in 98, so it's tw 21 years. And, um, you know, if, if I look at how I started in the fitness industry, obviously, growing up as a kid, my brother was a bodybuilder back in the 80s. So I used to watch him as a kid, and he was 10 years older than me. And my first experience was at a gym that he was training at in, in Maroubra, um, which is not far from Coogee, actually. And um, I used to go there and watch him getting ready for comps. And so I knew from the age of 10 that, you know, this is what I want to, what I want to do in my life. Didn't know I was going to actually, you know, obviously own a gym, but I wanted to be in the fitness industry. So, you know, you know, that happened. So obviously it happened when I was 21. I started owning my first gym at 21. It was almost 11 years thereafter that. And it was something that, you know, was in my blood from a young age, because as you can, you know, um, attest to, when you when you're a kid and you're watching this guy that seems like he's like the Hulk, you know you watch the Hulk on TV, and back then you know I used to watch the Arnold movies, 
you know, I used to look up to my brother and, and I, I'm, I'm, I know like the whole area I used to look up to him because no one had seen someone like this guy. And, you know, you think about when you're 10 years old, how impressive is that when you can see someone where you go, this doesn't look real. And it wasn't so long after that, if you think about it, 11 years and so that far after that point when I was 10 years First old. First initiation, yeah. And, you know, and then I just knew I was going to be partners with my, my, my brother at that point. And everything seems like a dream. You, you know, you go in, you own your first gym. You know, I was 21. I knew nothing about you know, running a business. I knew a lot about training people because I trained all my life. I started when I was 13. But, you know, once you start running with the business and you're behind the desk, the game changes because now, you know, what seemed like a dream and this is going to be my hobby, you now it changes into a job. And so then you've got to start thinking of your customers, you've got to start thinking of, you know, the outlay that you need to put into the gym and, and what that's going to cost. But we didn't do nothing about that. And so... Sometimes going and throwing yourself in the deep end is where the success is and with that comes a struggle because if you're in the deep end and you don't know how to swim and you've got to make it back to the shore, you've got no choice. Yeah, that's true. And I guess, you know, when you're making those sacrifices at the time, I'm sure there was a lot of times that you're doubting yourself, you're second guessing, you're thinking, have I made the right decision? Mm. You know, did any, did did it come to any point where you thought we're going to have to close this down? We're going to have to start something else, or did you both encourage each other to just keep persistent? And this was the right move that you'd made. Well, I'll tell you how hard it got. So you know, we all had to find second jobs. Um, our wives and our mum were supporting, just putting food on the table because we weren't making any money. So what happened was we we actually bought the building that we were in. Um, which which seems like a good move if you're making money. But at, now at this point, um, you've got the banks on your back. So we were struggling to make payment and, and you know, you, we could see how hard our wives and mum were working to support us in in our dream. And there, there was an end point to that. And then we sat down one day and we said, look, let's just, let's just sell the building. You know, um, because it was really hard, Chris. And oh, this wasn't like, you know, um, two years of making money. This was about like three, four years. So imagine for three, four years, you're not making money. Can you stick to it? Like you go and ask, you know, a worker, an, an employee, look, just hang around for four years. I can't really pay you. Do you reckon they're going to stick to it? Probably not. Yeah. And so it got to that point where we had to make a decision. So we decided to sell the building. So... That was really hard. Imagine you're at the you're you're at the solicitors and you're signing paperwork and you've got to sign it and now this is the end. It's an eighteen month settlement. So it got to that point where we signed and we're like, fuck, what did we just do? Right? So then we and my brother were having a chat to each other, said, Listen, you know what? Let's just fucking go for it and see what happens. Right? So we've got eighteen months now. Once it settles, we've got to be out of that building. And so we started working our butts off. We started really working and we started digging deep. The business started growing. And the only way we could get out is if those people that were buying the building didn't sign their documents on that day. So we're fucking waiting now 18 months. And it's not the best feeling when you've got to wait and you go, fuck, I've made a wrong decision here. That, so that day came and they didn't sign. And we pulled out of the deal. Awesome. So that's when the tide actually changed and you, and you were actually starting to make money? Yeah. Look, no, look we, we didn't actually start to make money straight away. And even after that, like, it, it just goes in ebbs and flows, Chris. It's not just straightforward. You could be doing well, but then you go back down and do well. And it's, it was just this constant ebbs and flows that you have to deal with. Once that happened, though... We said, we're not getting out now. We're going to be in the dogfight and we're going to stay in. And we're going to make something of this no matter what and we're never going to look back. So you, when you get that opportunity, now you, that second opportunity, now you, you've got a chance. You can't let anything, any complacency get in the way. And it's just the hard work and the grit that you need, but also the support. You need the support around you at that point because in those low points, you can't be on your own. You know, we, we got a good family, you know, and even though, and you know, like, and, and everyone knows this, when things aren't going well and there's no money coming in, 
That's what creates problems for families. And, you know, there was arguments and there was tough times within those m- moments. And, um, but we knew this, that we were never going to let that happen again. And, you know, for, for many years thereafter that, it wasn't still easy, but we were never going to quit now. You know, we made that commitment. Yeah. So you just consisted, you, you consistently persisted going forward. So then at what stage after this did you uh, decide that maybe we want to expand and open a second yeah. gym? Well, I think that was, like, Murat knows the numbers better, man. He's not better with the numbers. But I think it was about 2007 or 2008, we decided to get Kensington. We were really originally looking at going to Coogee. But the problem with that was that it wasn't for sale and the price was way too high. So we said, all right, let's, let's, let's go to the next stepping stone. Let's go to Kensington. And, and in life, you've got to create these stepping stones because the next gym was bigger than the one we had. And then we started doing classes. We, we had a crash. So I had to learn all these new things, how to run a crash, how to, how to run gl- classes and how to have a group fitness manager and all that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of learning that I needed to do at that point um, in order to move to the next one. So, you know, if you look at your, your life, it's an apprenticeship. You're a student. You're constantly learning. And sometimes the best way to learn is on the job. And, but I wouldn't advocate for people to try and learn the way I did. I've just, we just kept going in the deep end um, because you need the stomach and you need the fortitude to be able to overcome those challenges and obstacles when they come. And I don't think everyone's made to, to be able to push themselves through really, really tough times. And so I always say to people, work under someone that's gonna tell you what steps you have to go through in order to be successful. And, you know, Kensington had its own challenges as well. You know, we, we, we got to a point there where we were doing well and, you know, um, you know, the rent increases, more gyms opening up in the local area was quite a significant challenge um, on us and then, you know, running two gyms. So, you know, and the way we are, we just jumped into Coogee while we still had Kenzo and, and Rockdale. And, you know, so now you're open. Now you've opened a third gym. Yeah, and that's a big, big move. F- massive move, you yeah. know. And I never forget, you know, having my brother in some of those meetings is just, you know, unbelievable. Like, because, you know, like Murat, you just don't know what he's going to say. And so, we we're having a meeting for Kensington where we said we need a a rent reduction, and the guy said, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do. You can have the rent reduction, but. If someone wants to go in this building and I'm going to advertise it, you've got to get out within a month. So we said, you know what? We're getting that now. So we started going in there and packing everything up, but we had already opened Coogee because now we were struggling in Kensington, right? So, and we already had, we had sold the business and the landlord um, just kept wanting documents from the new guy going in. And that went for six months. So that sale fell through as well. And so we're like, fuck, man, we need, we need, we needed funds. And we just said, you know what? My brother said, we're, we're, we're getting out of this lease because the lease is finished now. And we're just going to fucking cut our losses and, and move on. And it was the best move we ever done, honestly, because we were, all, we were able to double down then on Coogee because then we just had Rockdale on Coogee and we were able to double down on the work that we were putting in a Coogee and we are growing that business exponentially. And then we learned a lot of lessons that we done wrong in Kensington. And so, you know, as the gym industry started growing, there was a lot more little gyms popping up in and around the area. What keeps us in the game is the resilience that we got from Rockdale. So if you have a look at the lessons that you learn from your first gym and, and you, you focus on those elements of never to give up, doesn't mean you can't let go of something that's holding you back because I'm still in the game, I've still got a gym. And our goal was to have one super gym. So that was always our goal. And so being in the game and still losing Kensington, we had to detach our emotions from what the, the, the ultimate goal was. And it's not like you had a loss. You, you still learn a lot of the craft that you wouldn't have learned if you didn't go for that second gym. And so moving into Coogee was a different beast in itself. You know, there's different expectations. There's different types of people that want the type of service that you know, they're paying for. And so that was a huge learning curve when I went across to there. And you've got to remember, each area has a different demographic of individuals. 
So if I was living rock down and going to Kenzo and then going to Coogee, I had to change who I was in yeah. order to deal with those types of clients. Much, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It, in order to communicate, some people like words of encouragement, yeah. some people like shout, being shouted at, mm. and obviously, yeah, you have to wear a different mask dependent on the area, I get that. Yeah, so that, that, that was a, but you, you, you can't learn that unless you're in the game. You're not going to learn that by sitting in the sidelines. You've got to be in the middle of the, the ruck, as they call it in, in rugby league, and you've got to put in the work because that's where the work is. That's where you win and lose the game. And so I was never one to shy away from the confrontations that, you know, that exist in the, in the fitness industry and, and dealing with those problems because I think if you allow yourself to be that person where they, anyone can come to, and you can solve those problems, well, it's the best you know, apprenticeship you could have in your life. Yeah. And then, you know, so, so you know, for, for instance, people here that are wanting to get into the bodybuilding fitness industry and make a career out of it, maybe don't look at that, like that super gym or that huge business model to begin with because maybe you should start small where the variables and the risks are lesser mm. and then you can learn from them before making that next transition mm. up. Because I guess like this is like bodybuilding really. You're not gonna go and step on an IFBB stage straight away. Mm. You're gonna start with your first contest in the first timers, then you gotta move to the weight category, age category, and then maybe to a pro qualifier. Yeah. You're not just gonna jump into the deep end because you're gonna learn from those dietary yeah. mistakes, those competition mistakes before moving on to the next. Yeah, that's hundred percent correct. And if you have a look at it, we started at Rockdale, where we done hardly any classes. We didn't have crash, um, we didn't have a spin studio, we didn't have all those. So, and then Kensington, we moved into there, and we had you know spin studios, we had group fitness studios, we had a smaller crash. They weren't obviously as big as what Kuji is, but what we done was there were stepping stones within that. And what you learn, like what a lot of people forget about business is, do you have a good insurance broker? Do you have a good financial broker? Do you have you know, a good solicitor, do you have a good accountant? We didn't have any of those in the first business. You were doing it all yourself? Well, I didn't know, but I didn't know much about it, mm. right? I didn't know that, you know, you know yourself, there's great trainers and there's ones that aren't so good. There's great gym operators and there's ones that aren't so good. It's the same with every industry. So, you know, at this point, we've got the right guys that advise us, um, you know, when we're setting up new companies and we're doing new ventures and all that kind of stuff. You know, even, you know, I'll go as far as marketing. You know, we, we, I knew nothing about marketing in, in Rockdale. You know, we, we didn't even have a website at the time. You know, there was no platforms at the time when we started there. And then those platforms started coming, but I didn't know any of that. And so when I look at the evolution of that, you know, I went through three accountants. I went through, through uh, three insurance brokers. Um, there's so much behind the scenes that you have to get right because... Honestly, it is a minefield when it is wrong and you make the wrong decisions of how to set up things and you've got to go back over it. So they're the kind of things that, you know, when you start small and, and, and you can then maybe get mentored from someone that's been in the industry, industry and you can set those processes and systems up right, it's gonna, you're going to make it much more of a smoother ride. And, you know, you don't... You don't want to go through and make the same mistakes that everyone always makes. You do you want to do your due, due um, diligence so that way you can make the right decisions. And you, we're always going to stuff up somewhere, right? There's always things that are going to go wrong. There's always variables, but if we can, you know, constrict those variables and make them less and less and less, we can be more proactive and more productive as well. Mm-hmm. All right, now I'm painting a picture for our listeners here, uh, and I'll put a link in our show notes to your facility. You can yeah. go to your website, you can see what it looks like. Like this is a phenomenal place. Uh, like, like I've mentioned all you know all the things before the the equipment, the classes, the instructors, the infrastructure, the area, the location, and you've extended because when you started there, it was a very small hardcore gym. Mm. And now it is a huge gym because you've actually extended, you've bought the building next door so you could uh, facilitate that. But one thing that I've noticed there more than any other gym is just the infrastructure, the people, the tribal leadership, the motivational, uh, inspirational atmosphere that you've got there. Like, is that something that you learned elsewhere? Or again, you've just come from that internally based on your own discipline, your own family orientation, if you will? Or was that something that just evolved over time to perfection? Well, what we've done, what I've done was I, 
went really hard in self-development and that was over 10 years ago because when you're running teams you've got to learn but you, you got to learn sometimes you can't look you don't know all of that yourself i mean you see you know how your family grew up and, and and what you need to do in those structures and you can bring those elements and those principles in there because at the end of the day it's about that family culture people love when you go you know, you go to a place where you eat, and you go. You know, it's 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 a it's a family recipe. And, and they re- uh, yeah, and they remember your name, 100%. and they remember how you like a particular yeah. food. Yeah, yeah, it makes you f- feel good. And you know, look, in the early days, my dad was there cleaning. You know, um, one thing my dad taught us was, man, you got you got to put in the effort, and you got to clean your gym. You got to make it. You got to keep it spotless. As a leader, when you lead and you start doing that, as a leader, when you go into every class and you introduce yourself to each and every person. When you go um, into the into the creation, you start introducing yourself to the mums and all that kind of stuff. But not only that, you get on the gym floor, you put the weights away. As an owner, you, this is this is your duty. You must do that. If you start doing all those little elements and you start helping your team and you help them develop and you 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 genuinely ask them questions about who they are and where they want to go and you can guide them in that right direction, you get a lot of respect. And when you start making sure you sacrifice your time in order to make your people better, to serve the members better, that's what creates culture. But it's the work you've got to put in. You can't sit on the sidelines and not put in the work. You can't get on the gym floor and not train. One thing I do a lot of is, obviously we run challenges. I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll block a whole day and I'll just do 10 back to back and that'll be complimentary from me. Oh, training? Yeah, I'll do it for free. I'll do it. So it's like, what are you going to give away for free? What service are you going to give away? If someone's got a problem and they go, man, I'm not getting what I'm wanting out of my membership, and I get that email, I'll respond directly to that individual, that member, and I'll do the work. And what I'll do is I'll bring one of my team members up. I'll say, come up, I'm going to show you what I do with this person. And they watch it and they respect it. But so does the individual you're training. I'll say, I want to bring one of my team members because I want to teach them what I'm doing with you. And when you do that with a member, they go, wow, he's not only training me, but he's teaching his team member, so I get the same service from his team. And when you start doing all those little things, it makes a massive impact on how the business runs. Yeah, and one of the other things I've noticed, sorry to cut you off, like when I've been there to your gym, I notice that, because sometimes I'm thinking, is Mets actually listening to me? Because I notice when we're walking around the gym, you're looking, if there's a little speck of dust or paper or dirt on the floor, you will pick it up. Yeah. Uh, you're not asking for the cleaner to come pick it up. No. You are actually picking it up and you're cleaning yourself. Yeah. You know, And like, you know, I hope you don't mind me saying, but you've become very, very successful now. I've been to your house where the estate is just multi-million dollar mm-hmm. properties. However, you and your wife, Susie, or your brother will be in there at 5 a.m. in the morning, like you said, cleaning up, working yeah. out. You're never too big to do the smaller jobs because, you know, everybody is there, I assume, to help each other. Mm-hmm. You're there to help a cleaner. Mm-hmm. A cleaner is out there to help someone else and so on and so forth. And I see that l- tribal leadership that is created by you mm-hmm. and it hasn't, it hasn't wavered. Yeah. It's still the same, if yeah. not possibly e- e- even more precise yeah. now than it ever was. Yeah. Now, how have you seen that? Okay, you mentioned that, you know, a lot of the members respect that. How has that actually helped your team culture as well within the workforce? Because I know, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that would would absolutely love to move to Australia and Mm -hmm. Kujiria. And you have people from all around the world Mm -hmm. working for you. You know, what what is it that, what is the standard that you have created within that Mm -hmm. team culture? And for instance, if somebody wants to come and work for Mm -hmm. Titan Fitness and yourself, what is expected of them? All we do is like people come in with their own standard, right? So everyone's got a baseline of what they think their standard is. What we do is we, we sit down with individuals and we create a standard that they never thought was possible for them. So I'll sit down with a team member and I'll make them believe that they can become anything that they want. But these are the guidelines and the principles and the rules to become that person. So then their standard lifts now. And as their standard lifts, all I do is get them a bit more uncomfortable and push them again to lift their standard again. Because one thing I do is that I don't accept the standard that exists within myself right now. I'm always looking, how can I improve myself constantly? And I do the exact same with them. And 
One thing I do is I don't treat them any differently to how I would have treated myself because I wasn't the most educated person when I was at school. I didn't do well. All I done was I understood that we could become anything we want as long as we constantly lift our standards. So people come in to Titan Fitness as this average person but they become this amazing person that they never thought existed within themselves. And it exists within any individual that's out there. And when you come to Titan Fitness, you know that we have a high standard already. And when we, when we bring you on, we don't expect too much from you, right? We don't, we don't expect you to have all the credentials that are needed to be in the fitness industry. But one thing I expect from everyone is an attitude to constantly improve. Yeah, and that must come with accountability because I always yeah. say this, there are millions of people out there that are students of learning. Mm. They read every book imaginable mm. under, sun, under the sun or watch every video documentary yeah. needed. However, mm. the big disconnect comes from the application yeah. because there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of sacrifice, there's a lot of hardship, you're working yeah. days, nights that you don't want to, weekends, whatever yeah. it is, or you're doing stuff that you don't want to. You know, how do you keep them accountable to ensure that they're not just learning their craft, but they're applying it? Performance management of numbers. So every month we'll sit down with team members and we'll look at all their numbers. And look, our biggest thing is success is created on impact, okay? So the more people you can impact, the more referrals you get for your business, right? And that happens organically if you do all the right things. So one thing I do is we'll sit down with team members and we'll look at all their stats, all their numbers. And when we look at their stats and numbers, we give them work that they need to do to improve those numbers. And if they do the work, invariably they will get the numbers that, they, that, they, that we put on them. Obviously they get rewarded for all their numbers that they, they reach and their targets, but that's what creates accountability. If you don't have a metric of a number that you have to get, you don't you can't measure it and if you can't measure it well how do you know how anyone's doing and it's the same with if anyone's doing a challenge or anything if they've got a certain weight and a certain number they've got to get to that's the accountability for those 12 weeks we do this every month we do this every month and we sit down with them we look at their goals we look at their metrics of you know sales in all the different areas but one thing i always also do chris i believe that Numbers aside, I always tell my team, your health comes first to me. If your health's not good, I'm not happy. I'm, I, I don't really care about your numbers. I want your health to be um, perfect. I want you to be able to come into work where you're, where you're happy, where you're, you know, you're excited, where your energy levels are through the roof, and you want to help more people and you want to ha- impact more lives. Okay, you can't do that if you're not healthy. Yeah, for sure. So it starts with the health. Yeah, it comes with their shop window front. They've got to look the part as well. But if they're not healthy, because, you know, I had this conversation with Sybil the other day. You know, quite often we'll look at people that are obese or overweight and we'll judge them. But then you have some people who are like an an ectomorph Mm. and they can eat absolutely anything that they want. A lot of junk food, a lot of fast food. However, they stay lean and we think that's healthy. Yeah. But maybe mentally, they're just not going to have that clarity. Yeah. They're not going to be as focused and they're definitely not going to have the longevity mm. that's associated with that. And now, kind of crossing over into my next question, because obviously I've known you for years. We've all fought, followed the typical bodybuilding lifestyle of the six meals a day and occasionally still yeah. do. But then, uh, you know, you, your, your father passed away. Yeah. And then I noticed there was a big shift in the way that you looked at food and the mm. way that you changed your diet. You yeah. started following like more of an intermittent fasting mm. style, especially when you're traveling. And your brother did the same, mm. got an incredible shape. Mm. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you were following like a little bit more of the keto style. Now you're following like a carnivore mm. style uh, mm. diet. Uh, based on this shift, you know, how has that changed you? And, you know, what was that tipping point with the passing of your father that actually changed this connection with you? Because now I've noticed a huge change uh, within you uh, by following that. And have you passed that on to your trainers? Yeah, look, to my term, definitely 100%. I mean, look, the co- Chris, the, 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 the biggest thing, you know, it was a pivotal point in my life when dad passed away and I was there for this you know seven weeks and seeing him get down under 50 kilos and then watching his last breaths I wanted to feel that whole thing uh, one thing um, for you wanted me, to experience I wanted it. to experience it man because you know 
I like shifts in my life and I like things happening for a reason and I like living a purposeful life. And I'm always looking for what that purpose is, even though sometimes like I'm 100% sure of exactly where I'm going and what I'm doing and, you know, been in the industry for 21 years. But I wanted to feel that whole thing. But I also wanted to go through and, and, and recollect every lesson Dad taught me throughout his whole life and what the meaning was. And so, you know, it, it was probably the, the, the toughest moment, you know, of my life. And it's funny, you know, I, I've been coming over season, I'm fucking getting a bit teary here. But, you know, flying um, from, you know, uh, Sydney um, to the States on my own, you know, you see people in the lines and, and you think about your dad, you know, you know, the, and the guys that, you know, that are that age. And you just think about the lessons, you know, and one of his biggest ones was, um, you know, you know, alcohol's not worth it, you know, and, you know, I've been here and you know what I used to be like, you know, I used to, you know, love the partying, but that those, those lessons are, you know, the most important and pivotal parts to, you know, you know, your life. And then, you know, we, we, we worked out that we have to look after our health in order to live um, a, a more purposeful life. Because a lot of us are fit and we look fit, but not we, necessarily we, healthy. 100%. And, and I, I wasn't like I was unfit, but, you know, I, I needed to find, we needed to find a way where, you know, we didn't, we weren't going to go down that route. And my brother had H. pylori at the time. I remember um, going in and out of the hospital and, and my brother was feeling the same pains my dad was, you know, and, and, you know, it's this it's this feeling you get and it's almost like we're positive people but at this point we're fucking a little bit negative because my dad's sick and my brother's not feeling the best. And so, you know, and my brother's only 50 and it was like, fuck, man, we we got to learn and we're going to learn on the run now. And and we we done everything to keep our dad alive. And so as we're going and learning on the run and, and getting him everything that he possibly could get to survive, we learn a lot during the process and you know intermittent fasting was one of those the, the ketogenic diet obviously and then you know looking at the carnivore diet for me I, I base everything on uh, my you know emotional standpoint and, and how I feel mentally and not just physically and so you know and I experiment with different diets and, and, and I love that sort of biohacking area but I go off you know myself and how my inflammation is in certain areas and, you know, right now I'm on the carnival diet, but again, you know, I'm eating organic. I'm eating, you know, humanely grown, you know, foods and, and, and vegetables grass and animals, you know, and grass yeah. fed. So, you know, that's a big point I like to make to individuals. Like it's, you know, and we grew up having six meals, but, you know, we've learned that that's not always what you have to do um, in order to have a healthy life. But also you can get in great condition. Like you've seen Murat is an unbelievable condition eating twice a day and doing it in a fasting. And, but, you know, and, 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 and look, there's so many different diets out there and you've got to find the one that really fits you and how it makes you feel. So from an inflammation perspective, I needed to know what foods were going to help me the most. And from a cognitive perspective, I needed to know what foods were going to help me be on my game and lift my standards. And like, if, if dad doesn't pass away, maybe we're not down this route. And I'm so happy and, and glad because... You know, when someone passes away, you can do two things. You can go to yourself, what am I going to learn out of this? And what am I, where am I going to lift my standards? Because that's what he would have wanted. He would have wanted us to go to that next level. I know what he's like. And he, and he even said towards the end, he said, don't worry about me. Because you guys are going to start living your lives. I mean, just, you know, he's like that. You know, my dad was always like that. Make sure you look after each other. But when I'm gone, man, I'm, I'm gone. And, you know, it's, it's, it's... It, it, it really um, changed my life for the better, I think, uh, at that point, you know, because I needed, I needed you, you never want death to take you to that point. And now I'm more grateful and I'm not getting complacent and going, I don't have to wait for anyone to go. I've yeah. got to start doing the work myself and feel like, what am I going to do each day to improve even more? Yeah, for sure. Like that's given you the accountability yeah. now, for sure. Like I, I can only imagine if you go out to a bar, a restaurant, and people are like trying to get you to eat bad food or drink a lot of alcohol or do whatever, you have that now in your mind to go, 
I'm going to say no and I'm going to stick to it. Mm. As opposed to in the past, you may have just got encouraged and said, yeah, what, what's mm. one meal? What's one drink yeah. or whatever? And start going down that rabbit hole because, mm. you know, we're kind of very similar like that. Yeah. We're kind of very addictive personalities. Yeah. You give an inch, I'm going to be taking a mile. Yeah. You know, so I, I could uh, t- totally understand that. So you've actually done quite a lot of tests and you did the Viome test, yeah. you've done uh, the DNA yeah. test, and they've actually told you to eat a certain way yeah. and a certain foods. However, you didn't feel that good on it. So you've actually kind of discarded to a certain degree those tests and followed what's worked for you. Mm-hmm. So what was your experiences after you'd done those tests? Mm-hmm. And then where did that lead to what you're doing now? Well, it's funny, I've done those tests and, and I, I followed it really, really good for, you know, uh, five weeks. But I wasn't feeling that much better, right? And it was funny, I was actually feeling a bit worse mentally. Like physically I was getting better, but mentally I just wasn't there. I was going, fuck, if I'm looking better, but I'm not feeling better up here, what the, what the, what the hell's wrong with me? So I decided to do a lot more research into things. And one of the things it said about me was that I should have meat once to twice a week. Well, I was doing that, and man, I, I just felt like shit, honestly. Um, I thought there was something wrong with me. I, I honestly thought, like, again, man, I'm feeling down, I'm feeling a bit depressed, I'm feeling a bit anxious. And I started thinking, I go, how many people are anxious and feeling a little bit depressed? And I go, I never used to feel like this. And when I lost control of my mind at that point, like, I could fight hard. Because, you know, I've gone through so many hardships anyway, through business and, you know, in, in life, that it, 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 it was good that I actually felt that because I could understand people better. And so then I started looking at different diets and I looked at the keto and then and the carnivore was probably one that suited me the most because I like having meat and I love having eggs and I don't mind organ meats, but I love meat. So then I started introducing that one. Within five days, I went in the spin room and, man, I broke a record in the spin room. Because you, you were actually quantifying it with the Amizo. 100%. Yeah. So I was quantifying it with the Amizo. But I felt so much more energy. And it's funny because when I was doing the Vime DNA fit test, I was struggling to get up at 5 a.m. Now I get up about 4, 4.30 a.m. most mornings. Now I'm getting up at 4, 4.30 without an alarm. Right? More and clarity. More, much more clarity. I was getting up at five, dragging my feet, trying to get in the gym and go, and not motivated for the workout. Like I'm not, not, not even motivated to push hard. And you know, when I went into the carnival diet, like my motivation was far greater. Like you said, I just went into that. I, I, I can switch my mind a lot faster right now to whatever the what, whatever the situation is at that moment. You can you cha- you change your perception, perception you change yeah. the environment from yeah. uh, surrounding you. 100%. Because like we got in a sauna when uh, Mets landed here the other day. We got into, we grounded first, yeah. get a little bit woo-woo now. And uh, then we got in the sauna, in uh, the infrared sauna. And then uh, we got in the ice bath. Now Mets hasn't done any cold therapy for over a year. And then it was mostly just cold showers. When Mets got in there, I was expecting, of course, a little bit of hyperventilation, a little bit of apprehension, but he just got in there. You know, arms submerged, chest submerged, neck, thyroid submerged, breathing like a yogi. And, you know, I guess that's got to be the power of that perception. I don't know how uh, that is influenced by the carnivore diet or not, but, you know, maybe that mental clarity that you're experiencing from it now allows you to fine tune that environment. 100%. 100%. I just think, if I look at it like this, right, and, and people go, like, I want to get in shape. I said, well, if you, can't, if you don't get your nutrition right, you're not going to get your mindset right. If you don't get your mindset right, you're not going to get your workouts right. So you better get your nutrition right to get your mindset right. Otherwise, you could be in the gym training, and, and then you're going to hit a wall. And you and may not actually quit. be as present as you could be within that rep, because yeah. there's a lot of mind-muscle connection. 100%. Too. And so... And that's, that's even evident with me. Now, like, I'm just, like, I'm much more focused. I, I, it, I'm not bullshitting right now. Like, I, I feel like my laser focus is far greater than at any point that I can remember. I agree with that because after we had that steak last night, mm-hmm. a dessert came out that they gave you for free. You and I were the only ones that didn't eat any of it. However, the other people that were with us was eating it. Yeah. Yeah, that's your mind control. Yeah, and, and what I actually done was 
um, so I didn't feel the pressure of alcohol. I just kept feeding simple alcohol. <laughs> 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 so, so that's one of actually this is one of uh, uh, Metz's traits now so he doesn't drink he will actually buy the rounds for other people so he doesn't get pressured and they don't go and purchase a round and get him a drink and then pressure him that's a, that's a good yeah, strategy yeah. I'm controlling my environment that yeah, way <laughs> there you go. yeah maybe not your pocket as much look you know this is why I look at it if I give him a couple of rounds I might be able to sneak out and do the runner. And they won't even notice until it's too late. They're just happy. They go, man, he's done a couple of rounds. He can do what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> Smart move. All right. Okay. So now, you know, this, obviously the gym, the, the culture that you've got, that you've created is absolutely been phenomenal. And, uh, you know, I'm not just saying that, Mets. You know, I'm, I've been very public about that for many years now. I appreciate that, Chris. Honestly, it does mean a lot to me because sometimes when you say, like, I go, man, it, because you know when you create something, it doesn't, like you go, this is just what I do, right? But then when other people go, they give you, you know, those accolades. And you, like when I know someone like you for so long, you know, sometimes I've got to be grateful and be very appreciative, and which I am. But I have to say that I'm grateful for you mentioning it that way because I know you mean it. But sometimes to me it's like, man, this is just what I do. Like it's not a big deal. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But sometimes I've got to sort of say, listen, Take a step back and say you're grateful for what other people are saying about you, Jim. You acknowledge and it, And be yeah. present and acknowledge it and just go, okay, maybe this is great what I've done. You know? So I just want to thank you for that. No, I appreciate that too. But yeah, it, it's something that I uh, am going to recognize and I am going to acknowledge it because like, just like with a transformation, mm-hmm. I don't just say pat on the back, you've got a great after picture. I'm like, pat on the back, that has a lot of sacrifices, mm-hmm. a lot of hardship. A lot of arguments, yeah. a lot of tears that you've gone through to get there, yeah. you know, and that's what I recognize, that's what I see, that's what I acknowledge, you know, uh, because I know there's so many people, much like, for instance, there are top athletes out there, and there's some subgrade athletes, or there, there's age groupers, they're not all bad, but there's some that just stand out above the rest, yeah. because they've persisted. They've gone, they're, they're disciplined. Mm. They've gone through the hardship, they've conditioned themselves. Mm. And that's what I see, it doesn't matter if it's a person, or if it's a transformation, or if it's a building, or it's a business, or career, or relationship, you know, there's a lot of sacrifice that needs to be made, and that's the one thing that you know I have mentioned, uh, you know, before now. A lot of people don't aren't willing to make the sacrifice. They would just see your success and go, "I'm I, I'm financially stable. I'm going to go and open a gym." It's not that easy. No. It's not that easy at all. No, definitely, hundred percent. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, thank you ever so much for joining me, Mets. I appreciate yeah. it. Have yourself a freaking awesome time in Vegas mm. at the Olympia. I really wish I was there. Uh, but uh, I'm going to instead chill out here in Boise with my fiance, who's soon, to, soon to turn 38. <laughs> 38, 38 years old. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't look a day over 40. 38. Yeah, 38. I, remember when I, I remember when I met you, you were like a kid. Yeah. 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 Well, well, it's all the alcohol you've been feeding her, you know? You're not 38, are you? No. <laughs> 31. Uh, no, nah, it's been an honour to be on uh, um, your Knowledge and Mileage podcast, Chris, and uh, I want to have you back again on your new studio. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so I can yeah. be on your podcast yeah, over yeah. in, in yeah. Australia. Well, I want to get you in the studio, man. And, uh, yeah. uh, it's, well, it's now called Muscle and Mind. Muscle so, and Mind podcast. Yeah, so gone, for yeah. all of you listening, we'll put a link in the yeah. show notes. The Muscle and Mind podcast. By the time Matt, we need put to check on the links out. as well, like I'll be able to check the website out because it'll be on. It'll be on. Um, I'll be able to just click onto the website and yeah. go right on there and get a lot of great information and I will get to see, you know, you know what we're doing and, and how we're evolving in the fitness industry and uh, what changes we're going to make um, in, the, in, the, in the within the next year to really you know bring the brand out there and really impact more lives like just like you man just you know our goal is just to impact more lives and i just yeah. want to thank you for today your hospitality here um absolutely loved it love you guys you know we've known each other since 2004 you know really um respect you for everything that you've done and uh just want to thank you again chris thank you very much buddy i appreciate it yeah, yeah. yeah. i have to get you back out here so we can hit the cardio this and time the in the snow slopes, slopes. yeah 100 yeah. no, thank sure. you a lot Cheers, brother. All right. If any of you uh, want to ask Mets or myself any questions, this is going to be on YouTube. You can ask questions there. And obviously the links, as everything has been mentioned today, during this podcast, you can find in the show notes. This is the Knowledge and Mileage podcast, and we is out.